In this video we're gonna go through everything there is to know about the squat. We're gonna go through common pitfalls, mobility issues, stability issues, whether we're talking about the back squat, the front squat, whichever variation we choose, the general guidelines are universal. This video is a bit detail oriented and lengthy for being just a YouTube video if you will, but I ask for your patience as I am sure if you're into strength training and the science behind the squat you're gonna learn a lot of new things from here. So we will begin this video with a little basic anatomy because I want you to know the function of each joint, of each muscle part and ligament, anything that has to do with the squat. And then we will go through correct and incorrect patterns and basic solutions to solve those incorrect patterns. What I want you to understand is that the reason for any kind of dysfunction or difficulty or technical error, if you will, when it comes to the squat, it all begins with general knowledge in anatomy, as simple as that. Because every body part has a specific function. If you are to build a house, you need to know the purpose of each structure of the house. If you are a car mechanic, you need to know the purpose of every structure in the car, every part of the car. But for some reason, in the world of strength training and sports, we are just going into this blindly. We are guessing our way forward. We're overly worried about our performance in the sport itself, and we seem to be very nonchalant when it comes to our own body, like how the structures provide for and the sporting movement themselves, like this is an important point. I'm not saying you should dive deep into this and become obsessive about it, no, you're an athlete, not a physiotherapist, but just because you're an athlete it doesn't mean that you should disregard every other mental model out there, you should know the basics of any mental model that is useful for your athletic career, and anatomy is one of them. Anyhow, this is how a textbook full depth high bar back squat looks like from a world class Olympic weightlifter. Can you tell me how many of the body's joints were visible here? How many of them were predominant here? Now, I might be a little bit biased considering I have a background in Olympic weightlifting, but I believe that if you want to tr truly study the most aesthetically pleasing squats in all of sports, you should study the Olympic weightlifters. When you squat, there are three main joints that are active. We have the knee, the hips and the ankles. And those are the levers, so to speak, that will allow you to complete a full depth squat. Now, each of those joints, they have a different anatomical function. For instance, although the knee can make very slight movements, the ligaments in the knee, they are able to move very slightly, the main function of them is actually stability. So we want to avoid the like movement at the knee when we're performing a back squat, of course. But if we study the hips, for instance, we can see that it is pretty much anatomically made to move. It can move in every plane of direction. So we can categorize those main, if you will, uh, the main body parts of your body, like categorize them in stability joints and mobility joints. And we're going to go through all of this later in the video. But if we do this, our work gets a lot more easier. And to study like the dysfunction of a squat, maybe your backgrounds, maybe you can't go deep enough, maybe you shift to one side more than the other. Then we have to ask ourselves, do I have enough mobility in the mobility joints and do I have enough stability in the stability joints? And this is the purpose of this whole video, to really help you, give you this anatomical basis of how everything works and give you the appropriate solutions for any dysfunctions. In other words, you need to be able to perform a squat with healthy biomechanics. So, that begs the question, what is considered healthy biomechanics? It's gonna depend on who you ask, of course, whether it is a professor, whether it is a commercial gym goer, whether whoever you ask, you're gonna get a different definition, obviously. But I go by this definition. Movement that occurs without pain or discomfort and additionally involves correct joint alignment, muscular coordination, and correct posture. In simple English, in plain terms, this means that the movement should be pain-free, and it should happen in a joint alignment that the body was naturally made for. And now, naturally made for, that is another whole philosophical discussion in itself that is beyond the scope of this video, but let's just go with that definition for the sake of simplicity. So if I'm working with a new athlete, for instance, I want to test and see all of those areas that they are adequate. We have enough mobility in the mobility joints and enough stability in the stability joints. And I will test all of those to see if they are good before I have them do heavy squats. I always say this, 
you can get away without injury when you only use your own body weight. Like you can do a squat and round your back and shift to one side with your hips if it only involves your own body weight because there is no external resistance. But when we add weights to the equation, you have 100 kilos, 200 kilos, whatever on your back, faulty biomechanics, they will punish you sooner or later. It's not a question of if you will get injured, it is a question of when. And not only that, like a faulty movement pattern, it's not cost efficient, it's costing you more than it should. So it not only increases your risk of injury, but it's costing more than it should. As simple as that. Okay, let's go through all of the structures involved in a squat. Let's start with the ankle. So the ankle is one of the mobility joints that is involved in your body and the squat, therefore. When you squat the ankle, it will obviously flex. The deeper you go, the higher this flexion will be. And the ankle is capable of flexing in four different ways. We have plantar flexion, dorsiflexion, inversion and aversion. During a squat, the dorsiflexion will be dominant. So you need to have enough mobility in this plane. Dorsiflexion, you can test this out yourself. Basically, take your foot and try to point your toes to the ceiling. That is a dorsiflexion. Now it is hard to pinpoint exactly, but you should be able to dorsiflex the ankles about 20 degrees. That is a normal limit the basic literature says, and to be able to do a full ass to grass squat, you would need sometimes above 38.5 degrees of dorsiflexion, so it is a little bit above the normal threshold. Generally though, the deeper the squat, the higher the demand for ankle mobility, so, and this is pretty rational of course, because when you squat down, and the ankles is one of the most predominant structures that will flex, so it is safe to say that uh, you need to work on this area significantly if you have mobility restrictions in the ankles, otherwise other structures in the body will start to compensate. As a comparison, regular walking requires about 12 to 20 degrees of ankle dorsiflexion, so you may still be able to squat to the bottom with limited ankle mobility, but once again your pelvis is going to tilt, your back is going to round, and that my friend is not a long-term solution, you don't want other structures in the body to start compensating for one mobility issue in one other area. Now obviously you don't need to memorize all of those numbers like pinpoint accuracy, instead I'm gonna give you a very basic test here that's very common in the world of rehabilitation and strength training to determine if you have adequate ankle mobility. This is called the knee to wall test, so you basically assume a lunge position like this with the foot 5 inches away from a wall or 13 centimeters for my European fellows with the metric system. Then you should keep your heels down on the ground as you can see in the picture right here and try to touch the wall with your knees without letting the heels rise from the ground. So if the heels rise or pain occurs you have failed this test, you have some mobility work to do. But if you can do this test generally you're good to go when it comes to as to grass back squats and you have no ankle mobility restrictions. So the main muscles that are necessary and responsible for carrying out dynamic ankle movement are the gastronomius and the soleus, or collectively they are called the calf muscles. The literature states that the deeper you squat, the more active the gastronomius becomes. So when you're above 90 degrees, for instance, the activity is very small. But once we start going below that to the as to grass level, the activity rises significantly. So it is directly proportional to the knee flexion. When doing as to grass squats at the bottom position, the gastronomius is at its highest activity level. So we can conclude that the deeper you wish to squat, the more ankle mobility you will need. So to assess if you have any weak points, in addition to the knee to wall test, you can do a simple bodyweight squat as well. Just stand in a shoulder width position and point your knees out approximately 7 degrees as this is the normal anatomical baseline and see if anything starts to happen. Watch out if your ankles start to shift to one side, if your heels rise from the floor, if your back starts to round. Do all of this and see, test it out for yourself and see what happens. Try to spread the weight evenly throughout the whole foot like a triangle as you see in the picture here. This is the textbook cue for when it comes to the center of balance on the feet when you're performing the back squat or any squat. So if you have mobility issues, one of the first symptoms that will arise is that your heels they will rise from the floor because 
uh, you lack the adequate ankle mobility so the body compensates in this way and this my friend causes tremendous pressure on the knees. You can see in this study below where they discovered that the forces on the ACL joint which is one of the joints in the knee we're gonna go through later in this video they increase dramatically when the heels are raised versus when they remain flat on the surface of the ground. You can see here the first number represents the ankles or the heels rather remaining intact on the floor and the second number represents when the heels rise from the floor so you can see it's a lot more force and pressure on the ACL joint here. So what happens when you lack the adequate ankle mobility and you try to squat with a zillion kilograms or pounds on your back? It is rarely the local area in question that suffers exclusively because when you lack mobility or have any form of restrictions in one area it is often a cascade of problems that arises. For example, if you lack the ankle mobility or the heels rise from the ground or they shift side to side the knees will start to overcompensate and because you can't go full depth and you lack the ankle mobility your back will start to round and this will promote compressive and shear forces on the discs of your spine the knee valgus will also make your knees overcompensate because you lack the ankle mobility. And all of those will be a cascade of problems and just this snowball effect. They say a chain is as strong as its weakest links and this mindset is very applicable to restrictions when it comes to bodily functions as well. So if you know for a fact after performing the test that you have limited ankle mobility, here are some solutions for you. Number one, you can invest in a pair of weightlifting shoes with the elevated heels as you can see here. And the soles of those shoes are extremely hard. This will make it a lot more easier for you to go deeper in a squat and maintain an upright squat position. So that is one solution. And in addition to that, you have to perform ankle mobility drills regularly, like twice a day. You need to stress this point of your body until it becomes flexible. There are many exercise solutions you can go but here are two alternatives. The first is the lunge position where you lean forward as far as you can on the one feet at a time like this without letting the heel rise from the floor. You want to pressure yourself in this position and make your body used to it. You don't want to force anything like don't pop your ankles, don't pop your Achilles heel. This is a very gradual process. Go to your maximum for the day a couple of repetitions, a couple of seconds and then repeat that every day. And another alternative is that you play, plant your foot pad against a wall like this and flex the ankle as much as you can on both sides. You can do those two. Those are very simple exercises, stretch mobility drills that you can perform. Next up we have the knee and the knee is generally regarded as a stability joint. Although it can move in very limited planes of motion like a matter of degrees but that doesn't facilitate it moving and handling big amounts of weights because as you can see it's only those small ligaments that allow for this movement and that is not enough to facilitate like you having 200 kilograms behind your back and trying to move with your knees only. That is the job of the ankles and the hips primarily to do to make the movement. The knee, the main purpose is stability. So in the knee area once again we have several joints and also they are surrounded by various ligaments and also cartilages. The function of the ligaments is mainly to stabilize the joints in a static manner that is stationary while the musculature around the knees that we're going to go into later they will stabilize the joints in a dynamic manner so when you're moving. There are two main joints in the knee area. One is the tibiofemoral joint and we have the patellofemoral joint. And the tibiofemoral joint is responsible for movement in the sagittal plane or in a straight perspective if you will in plain English. It is normally anywhere from 0 to 160 degrees. And then the patellofemoral joint, just like the name suggests, it allows for the patella to slide effectively over the surface of the knee during flexion and extension. And this obviously allows for more leverage and effective transfer of force when you're doing a squat for the example. If this mechanism didn't exist, you wouldn't be able to produce a lot of power in a squat when you were performing it. And as we mentioned earlier, those joints, they are surrounded by a whole bunch of stabilizing ligaments. Let's go through briefly the function of each and every one of them. So first up we have the ACL, and I would say this is probably one of the most vulnerable ligaments of the knee, and you hear the ACL everywhere. ACL injury here, ACL injury there, it's everywhere. The function of this ligament is to prevent something called anterior tibial translation. In plain English this means the tibia sliding forward like a drawer. And anatomically it makes sense because it's placed on the anterior side of the knee like the front side so it prevents that drawer mechanism if it functions correctly. 
So when you're doing a back squat or any squat, the maximal amount of anterior shear stress happens when you're at approximately 60 degrees of knee flexion. When speaking of shear stress, it is that sliding motion once again. So the ACL is our savior here, because once again it accounts for the majority of the protection here. And studies have shown that when the hamstrings are contracted, the shear stress that is placed on the ACL is decreased significantly. What this does is that it directs some of the force on the tibia, and therefore the force is required, that is required for finishing a squat, for instance, will be evenly distributed to this structure as well, instead of being heavily concentrated on this fragile ACL ligament. If there is one tip I have for you when it comes to injury prevention is that concentrated force is never a good solution. You should always try to lift something collectively with all of the main musculatures involved, instead of lifting with one structure exclusively because this one will take concentrated force and that quadruples the chance of injury. Next up we have the PCL joint and this is similar to the ACL. It also prevents translation, that drawer mechanism that we talked about, but in the posterior plane, the backside that is. Forces on the PCL will be the greatest during the concentric portion of the squat. That is when you push off from the ground, when you descend from the bottom. And PCL injuries, however, are way more way less common than other ligaments, the vast majority of lifters will most probably injure their ACL and the vast majority of lifters will never reach a high enough weight that will be a real danger to the PCL. It is often not like a squat injury that leads to this, it is probably other like traumatic injuries from, I don't know, an accident or something. And of course we have the MCL and the LCL, the lateral collateral ligament and the medial collateral ligament. Medial, that means when it is like towards your body, towards the center of your body, just a rule of thumb you can keep up when you want to learn those fancy pants Latin words, and the lateral collateral ligament is when it is away from the center of your body. And the function of those two ligaments is to fight excessive side-to-side -side movements of the knee, as you can see here, where they go way beyond the center line, as demonstrated by the picture varus and valgus that is, but valgus I would say is way more common when we're talking about squats, like the knees rotating inside, and this can be solved through a number of ways that we're gonna go through later. Now let's talk about squat depth. This is a pretty broad issue if you will. I will tell you this, that the science says that the higher the knee flexion and consequently squat depth that is, the higher the compressive forces will be. And, but this is not necessarily a bad thing. The only time a deep squat will be bad is if other structures start to compensate, which is if you lack the adequate mobility, of course. When I train my athletes, initially I would want them to do as deep of a squat they can if their sport requires it, of course. I don't just generally assume that everyone should do a deep squat. It is very aesthetically pleasing from my point of view as even a competitive Olympic weightlifter, of course. But I will never force a position if their body is not ready for it yet. Like, I will tell them to do a deep ass to grass squat, yes, if they can do it without anything having to compromise, yes. But if something has to compromise, we have some mobility work to do first. We cannot see something from like one point of view or our own point of view. Like if I am flexible as an octopus, I cannot expect another athlete to be that way. There is levels to this game. Some people are genetically more flexible. There is different lengths of limbs, all of that. It varies dramatically sometimes. And we have to respect this as coaches and solve it adequately. Now moving on, we also have cartilages in the knee area. And those are basically compressive pads, you could say, that try to like soften the compressive force that happens when you do a back squat for example you have 200 kilograms on your back and it becomes this compressive force those are the cartilages that are responsible for easing that compressive force and one of the most basic ones are the meniscus of course that is one of the cartilages and we also have the articular cartilages and this obviously once again handles the compressive force when it comes to shear force however that sliding motion once again it is the ligaments like, it's, not, it's really not that complicated. You just have to look at them, how they an anatomically are constructed and everything begins to make sense. Now, when it comes to the positioning of the knees, optimally the knees, they should be aligned with the hips and the feet. If this is done poorly, the ligaments and tendons will take damage, obviously. Because then that sliding force, once again, the shear force will be combined with compressive force because of the weight on your back and this is not a good combination. 
Now, if you're not able to maintain this alignment, there are many reasons for it. It can be underdeveloped musculature surrounding the knees, for example, the hamstrings and the rectus femoris, which attaches the hip and the knee joints together, and the gastrocnemius, which attaches the knee and the ankle joints, and many others. If those are weak or they lack in adequate flexibility, this can make it hard for you to maintain this proper alignment. But just hang on because I will present the solutions very soon. Another issue that I wanted to go through is the classic knees over toes issue. Supposedly it is a common notion that if your knees go past the toes it is very dangerous, it makes you vulnerable, they should never go past the toes, that is the worst thing, it's the end of the world. Or that the shin bones need to remain completely vertical when performing a squat. And this is really an unnecessary restriction given that you have the appropriate mobility in these structures. I will begin by saying this, in lifting once again, or body movements in general, any extreme is really a good solution. And if natural position is sacrificed at any time, structures will start to compensate. So if you have adequate ankle mobility and hip mobility, this is of no issue. But if any extreme happens, like you start leaning towards the knee, they take a lot of damage, any structure starts to overcompensate, that is good. So it is not a question of knees over toes per se, it is a question of overcompensation. Does one structure overcompensate? That is the issue. Like, don't mistake the trees for the forest. Different sports will have different demands. In the sport of Olympic weightlifting, for instance, it is necessary to be able to squat full depth because this is the movement that you catch the clean and jerks, like this bottom position, and you cannot neglect it. If you observe competitive Olympic weightlifters, they seem to go against this common notion of knees past the toes and all of that. But... It is for the simple reason that natural position is not sacrificed in other parts of the body. Compare those two images when it comes to knees passing the toes. Lifter A has his feet completely flat on the, and stable on the floor while his knees pass the toes because he has the corresponding mobility in all appropriate joints. While lifter B, however, you can see that his heels rise from the floor and all of that and it, it, it places excessive stress on the knee joints. His hips and back will also start to compensate and they will bend. In this case... It is catastrophic and injury will likely happen at some point. This is the difference. It's not that knees over toes is a bad thing per se once again. It is only bad when everything else starts to compensate. Now let's go through some analysis and adjustments when it comes to the main issues of the knee. When you squat with faulty movement patterns involving the knees, you will experience varus or valgus movement perhaps. You will experience anterior tibial translation or posterior tibial translation, that drawer mechanism once again. And the consequences of this is that the knees will experience both shear force and compressive force combined and the risk of injury is dramatically increased. And what are the solutions? The best thing you can do for some ACL weak points that is like strengthening work of all the musculature around that we discussed earlier, the glutes and the hamstrings, but that is kind of beyond this video because then we get into a really deep area of rehabilitation and um, an ACL issue, it can be something deeper that requires medical attention, so that is beyond the scope of this video. So instead I'm going to talk about one of the most common knee dysfunctions when it comes to the squat, and that is the valgus, when they, the knees shift inside. So to, make, to combat this, it might be a technical issue, first of all. Like, it might not be something that requires a strengthening or stability work per se. It might be a technical issue. So the first solution is to be consciously aware of the tech good execution. Like, try to maintain good alignment with your knees, feet, and hips. And spread out the mass evenly on the whole foot when you're performing a squat. And also, you can perform banded squat and consciously push the knees out against the resistance. Like when you have a pair of bands on you when you do the squat, it makes it really easily to naturally push it out because you will have this resistance. And this will really teach your brain how to perform the movement correctly and get this uh, motorics correct. This is something that you have to do if you want to combat this valgus, which is one of the most common knee dysfunctions when it comes to the back squat or any squat in general. Next up we have the trunk. Now when we are speaking of the trunk it is often referred to the spine, both the thoracic and the lumbar, and all of the core musculature surrounding it. Let's go through the spine quickly so that we're on the same page. Now depending on the region of the spine it is capable of moving but very minor movement. The spine consists of 24 movable segments of vertebra and each of the vertebra can display about 3 degrees of movement, some being more flexible than others. 
Now, just because the vertebra can be moved, it doesn't mean that you should always lift with your spine alone. Sure, you can sit with a bent back for hours and get away with it. You can do minor movement that only requires your own body weight. But when we add weights to the equation once again, especially heavy weights, it becomes a whole nother thing. And you need to start incorporating your muscles here and lift the weight with everything collectively. And between each of those vertebrae there exists a disc. And inside the disc, in the core of it, there is something called nucleus pulpus. Those discs, they will hold each vertebra together and act as shock absorbers. And once again allow for dynamic movement to a certain extent. So for example, when you bend your back to pick something up, this disc will get squeezed, the jelly that is. As a natural instinct, you might even place one hand on the upper thigh as you bend down to instinctively relieve the stress. Now, now you're just bending with your body weight, you're gonna get away with it. It's okay once again, but... The problem is when external weights once again come into the equation. When you have 200 kilograms on your back, what happens then when you lift with this bent back? All of the compression, it will be concentrated to one specific disc, one vertebra, like one area. This hyperconcentration, when shear force and compressive force once again is combined, it can end catastrophically long term. So your job in any lifting movement, whether we're talking about the back squat, the deadlift, any lifting movement in the gym is to put the spine in a neutral position so that the discs remain centered with an even compression. As long as the compression is even on all the structure and is centered like equally everywhere, you can get away with very very heavy weights. It is when one area gets hyper concentrated, one area gets bent, the force gets concentrated, that is when the danger comes. So your spine or the vertebral column as it is known as in fancy pants scientific language is surrounded by a whole bunch of different muscles. The key ones are the erector spina, the abdominal muscles, the quadratus lumborum and the gluteal muscles. And speaking of the glutes, this is not always obvious but they actually play a very large role as well when it comes to stabilization of the spine. And all of those muscles they can be further divided into subcategories but Collectively their purpose when it comes to the squat is to provide with stability because once again the spine is very fragile It's just those bunch of vertebra with some discs in between them So we need to engage all of those muscles so that they sort of isolate the spine And we lift a heavy weight collectively with all of the structures and nothing gets left out individually So some subcategories of the abdominal muscles are the erectus abdominis otherwise known as the six-pack muscles the purpose of this one is to flex the trunk and prevent extension of the spine and forward tilting of the pelvis, if you will. Then we also have the oblique muscles, those are the ones that are located to the side, like the side muscles on the abdominal region, and they will stabilize the core and provide with lateral stability so that you don't shift side to side. And finally we have the transversus abdominis, which is located more deeply, and it also provides stability, of course. Let me give you an analogy of the importance of stability. Let's imagine you attach a heavy weight to a very thin rope like this and the weight is lifted up. Because the weight is so heavy the rope would probably detach. But imagine you attach six more ropes so that they lift this weight collectively. Then obviously nothing will break because the lift is lifted collectively with a lot of structures involved. and. You need to see like the core tension, the muscle tension in your body when you're lifting a heavy weight in this manner. You need to lift it collectively so that nothing is left out individually once again. I will be very picky about this point. I will stress it over and over again throughout all of my videos and I always do it with my athletes when I work with them. Because this is a major factor when it comes to injuries why athletes get injured. Because they don't engage everything collectively. They just lift with one structure and everything gets hyper concentrated. So a good squatting technique when it comes to the spine is generally characterized by a rigid spine that prevents any forward or tilting motion. You just keep your upper body as upright as you can with no like lumbar flexion, no thoracic flexion significantly to that level. It is just kept rigid throughout the whole movement. But because of different anatomies, mobility levels and the relationship between the positioning of the lumbar spine and the pelvis, some very slight forward movement might happen, especially the deeper you go in the squat. So if an athlete either has a technique, mobility or stability issue and they do the squat, what happens exactly with the spine during the descent and the ascent? 
One very common symptom is hip pain and if you continue to squat down deeply despite those mobility or technical restrictions you might even experience something called a posterior pelvic tilt, otherwise known as the butt wink, which I am sure you have heard of. And this will place the spine in a disadvantaged position and all of the force will get hyper concentrated to one specific area once again and it quadruples the chance of injury. Minor butt wink like this is of no issue, but when it becomes excessive that is a problem and it will be a problem long term. So to really make you grasp the importance of the concept of sliding motions when compressive forces are present as well, like how they both contribute to excessive force on the spine, you can look at this study. They concluded that by only doing half squats with a load of 0.8 to 1.6 times the body weight, the compressive forces on the L3, L4 region, that is the third or fourth vertebra from the lumbar spine, it could increase by 6 to 10 fold the body weight. It is safe to say that a neutral spine is paramount when you're performing a squat so that an even compression happens. With that being said, imagine you have this compressive force with the 6 to 10 fold force of the body weight and you're not keeping like a rigid, perfectly evenly compressed spine. You bend your back and you hyper concentrate all of that force to one vertebra. Well, you can do the math yourself what's going to happen long term. So as long as we tighten the correct musculature and our back is remain neutral, we can handle very heavy loads naturally. And that is for the simple reason once again that the force is evenly distributed and the body works as a whole. Now we can't pinpoint in exact numbers how much a vertebra is designed, like how much weight it is designed to handle. Some works suggest 600 to 800 kilograms of actual force because before something goes wrong. But that's not important because none of us will reach such numbers ever anyways just know this as long as the force is straight down in a straight line instead of like this twisting or bending fashion we will be fine and as long as we correct the right musculature so that they isolate the spine so that it remains evenly and flat we will be fine just by a two degree increase in extension of the spine from a neutral position generally speaking you can increase the compressive force on the disc annulus by 16 percent and that is very significant, just by 2 degrees. Now imagine what happens if you exaggerate this even further. And imagine what happens if you do this day after day, just forcing your body into a position it's not even ready for yet. You keep increasing the weights despite this limitation in even compression of the spines. What, was, what is going to happen? It is no wonder why back injuries have become an epidemic like amongst commercial gym goers who have no idea what they're doing. And one more thing I want to talk about before we go to the analysis and the adjustments is the location of your gaze. Like, research it shows when you look forward or slightly up, it actually makes it easier to maintain an upright posture and a neutral spine. So, really think about your gaze when you're doing a squat. Like, don't look down on the ground. Look forward or slightly up. Trust me, this will make it easier for you to remain upright. This is very visible if you observe the Olympic weightlifters. They, when they ascend the squat, they always like try to look slightly upwards and it really helps them to keep this upright posture. So when analyzing faulty movement patterns involving the trunk, it is often excessive flexion or extension of either the thoracic spine or the lumbar spine, most commonly the lumbar spine. We can allow slight flexion or extension of the thoracic spine, but when the lumbar spine is way more vulnerable in this area and it is like very important to keep the lumbar spine especially neutral. Extension or every, any flexion of the spine at any time during the lift, like this dynamic, if it starts throughout the lift, that is even worse. Like, at least if you're gonna bend a little bit, it should be bent all the time. Like, it shouldn't move at any time during the lift. This is when that concentration of force happens. And also this excessive posterior pelvic tilt that we talked about, butt wink, that is also a bad symptom of faulty movement pattern in involving the trunk. All of those factors will collectively once again lead to concentrated force at a specific point, at a specific vertebra or a disc, and the risk of injury is dramatically increased. Now, what are the solutions to all the problems related to the trunk and the spine in general? First of all, it can be like a technical issue, like a technique biomechanics issue, or it can be a dysfunction at another area. For the former, be co conscious about the correct mechanics of a squat. Like keep a proper core tension, keep a neutral spine, head high, chest up, feet evenly planted on the ground, all of this. And if it is a dysfunction, 
when it comes to the spine problems like your back bending and all of that, it is rarely like problems at the spine itself. It is other regions of your body that are making you suffer. Like for example, like we talked about earlier, when you're immobile at the ankles, this will often express itself by your back rounding. If you have bad hip mobility, it will also cause your back to round because the back is one of those structures that always compensates when you are weak in some other area in the nearby regions. So address the dysfunction of all other areas. You will learn through the remaining body parts in this video also. We have discussed the ankles and the knees and the trunk now so far. We have the hips to go. So the hips, they generally provide a pathway of transfer of forces between the lower body and the upper body during squatting. Anatomically, the hip is just a ball and socket joint and it is designed to move in all major planes of movement, as you can see. However, the flexion is the broadest range of motion that it has. In the other ones, the range of motion is way more limited. So yeah, it is safe to say that the hip is regarded as a mobility joint and we therefore need adequate mobility to be able to perform good squats. And the primarily muscle groups that are involved in the hip region and therefore stabilize the hip region are the gluteus maximus and the hamstrings. The gluteus maximus will be very active in both the eccentric and the concentric portion of the squat, that is when you go up and down. And it is also presumed that it provides stability to the knee and the pelvis because it is attached to the iliotibial band which crosses both of those structures. Now it has been observed in some studies that the activation of the gluteus maximus will be in line with the squat depth. This study for instance showed that gluteus maximus activation was not very significantly different in the partial and the parallel back squat, but in the full ass to grass squat the gluteus maximus activation was the highest. You can see the numbers here yourself. And since hip torque is in line the more the hip flexes, the maximal torque happens at the bottom of the squat. So it makes perfectly sense that glute activation is higher in a deep squat because the gluteus maximus once again acts as a stabilizer muscle to the hip, amongst other things. So that might beg the question of how much hip mobility is required for a squat. First of all, I want to say this. An athlete might be able to perform a deep squat, but can they do so with correct posture? So this question is a little bit vague. A better question to ask is... How much hip mobility is required for an individual athlete to perform a squat with good posture? Because that is a whole nother thing. A squat with good posture and just a squat. It's difficult to say because anatomies and proportions vary significantly. It's a matter of evaluation. You have to do mobility work until you can do a full depth back squat if you desire that and you can do it with good posture. Out of all the details we have went through for so far and I will provide a summary at the end also of what a good posture is when it comes to the all of the collective body parts of the back squat or the squat in general. And then we have the hamstrings of course which is the other major stabilizing muscle when it comes to the hip region and the activation of the hamstring seems to be relatively constant during the squat regardless of the depth. In comparison to the glutes the hamstrings are way less active during the squat and mainly that is because it has to function as a hip extensor and a knee flexor. It is biarticular in other words, like it has to do multiple roles simultaneously. So when it comes to raw activation, you can actually activate the hamstring much more in an exercise like the stiff leg deadlift or a Romanian deadlift for instance. So what happens when you lack the necessary hip mobility or the stability of the, all the musculature surrounding the hip. One compensatory mechanism is the lumbar flexion at the bottom once again, the butt wing, similar to the previous point of the other structures that we talked about. And because you can't move about your hips when you descend and ascend a squat, what's gonna happen? Well, you're gonna overcompensate at the back, it's gonna round also once again, your heels are gonna rise from the ground, all of this like... It is related to the previous points once again, like one problem, why, like I said, it is related to all of the previous dysfunction at other areas as well, because it's rarely like one specific thing that gets affected, affected. it's a cascade of different things. Consequently, like all of those factors, once again, they will lead to force being concentrated at one specific point of the body and risk of injury is dramatically increased. What are some solutions? Number one is to... Like, it can be either a mobility issue or a stability issue, but if you're, like, unsure, you shouldn't, like, guess. You can do both of them simultaneously. Just do mobility work and stability work simultaneously. Like, the pigeon stretch, the knee-to-chest stretch. Stretch all of the 
stretch the glutes and the hamstring area to really open up those hips. There's a lot of solutions, like you don't need my video for it. There is a million of different stretches and exercises you could do. You can probably find that out yourself if you found out my video. The hard part is just doing it consistently, like day after day after day, like not skipping every day. This is a very gradual thing and you have to remain consistent. It's not gonna affect you if you just do it once a week. You have to do it, you have to be consistent. And the musculature involving the hips, like we talked about, that is the glutes and the hamstrings mainly. So you have to strengthen those areas. You can do lateral band walks, you can do the clamshell, the single leg Romanian deadlift, the banded squats. There is many solutions. Once again, it's about consistency. There is like no secret exercise per se like that. You just have to choose one specific concept and stick to it. So here is a little summary of the major concept that I have discussed today, like here is a little graph that I have divided every single body part, their function, like a suboptimal pattern and an optimal pattern, and you can just screen through this and see what you need the most work in. You can make your work easier by dividing like the structures of your body once again to stability joints and mobility joints. And test all of those things I have given you, like record yourself doing a back squat, a regular squat, whatever, see if any of those symptoms appear and just attack them one by one accordingly to finally achieve that aesthetically pleasing and anatomically correct squat. Thanks for watching. Good luck.